Great. Welcome, everyone. We're glad to see you today. My name is Jordan Moni. I'm the Director of Events and Communications for the Security Studies Program and Center for Security Studies. And welcome to the final event in our spring speaker series, The Future of Security. Uh, just a couple of quick reminders. Please do keep yourself muted throughout the presentation. You are welcome to turn your camera on. You are welcome to leave it off as well. We know that this is during the lunch hour for a lot of folks, and so you may be uh, enjoying your uh, afternoon salad. If you like. um, we are recording this session. You will see that up in the corner of your screen. Do keep in mind that if you unmute yourself, your audio will be recorded. And if you ask a question and turn your video on, your video will also be recorded. Um, but if you keep yourself muted, then nothing will be recorded at all. We will have Q&A when you, we get to the end of the presentation. Please do hold your questions until the end. Once we get there, you can either raise your hand or you can send them in the chat directly to me and I can ask them out loud for you. With all of that out of the way, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today. Luke Kozlowski is a research assistant or research analyst, sorry, at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology, often known better as CSET. Previously, Luke was a research associate at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies, where he worked on science and technology policy and founded the Center for Enterprise, Exploration, and Defense in Space. Luke has also served as a staffer in the House of Representatives. Luke, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jordan. Thanks for having me and for that lovely introduction. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about training tomorrow's AI workforce using community and technical colleges. Um, I'll give you an overview of our work on this and then we can move on to some questions or if there are no questions, we can just steal back half an hour of our day and enjoy this lovely weather. So I'll start with a little bit about CSET for those who might not be familiar. Um, so we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank, and we're actually situated within the Walsh School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown. Uh, we try and bridge the gap between security and technology and policymakers to give them data-driven analysis um, to help inform their decisions. So we've focused largely on AI over the last three years. We're fairly new, but we're branching out into other areas um, like biosecurity. So within that, my focus is specifically on AI workforce issues, which brings us to our topic today. So we're going to start with three questions. Uh, first, what's the AI workforce? Uh, second, why do we care about it? And then three, how do we grow and strengthen it? Next slide, please. So first, what is the AI workforce? So answering this question was one of the first things the workforce team did at CSET. So we decided to consider the entire team of people needed to design, develop, deploy, and acquire AI-enabled tools and capabilities. So uh, due to this expansive definition, this includes both technical and non-technical talent grouped into four different categories. So in a nutshell, the technical team on the top there uh, builds the nuts and bolts. The product team on the bottom right uh, helps in the design and production process, so people like product managers and UX designers. And the commercial team works to scale, market, and make sure that these applications make money. So within the technical team, there are two categories, one and two. So technical team one is that PhD level research scientists and others like computer engineer and data architect, architects and coders and these are the real, no kidding, top tier talent. So technical team two are those that possess AI related skills and competencies, but um, might need some minor training to work on AI development teams, but they can. So after we defined the AI workforce, uh, we found that it consisted of about 54 different occupations and currently consists of about 14 million people, which is about 9% of the total uh, US employed. Next slide, please. So why do we care about the AI workforce? This is something we hear from a lot of policymakers when we brief them. And the short answer is because without an AI workforce, you don't have any AI. Um, but on top of that, uh, cultivating a leading AI workforce was a strategic focus of the DOD's 2018 AI strategy, which also recognized just how critical AI will be strategically in the future. Uh, it's also already unique in how widely adopted it is, and this is only going to continue as it, as it continues to develop. We already use AI in our daily lives, even if we don't realize it, and many critical sectors have extensive AI capabilities embedded within them, um, even in uh, industries you don't hear often about. So that's like finance and agriculture and entertainment and all the normal tech ones that you might think of immediately. So on points uh, three, four, and five, because uh, 
of the both technical and non-technical talent needed for AI creation. AI education is a lot broader than just STEM or computer science, um, where a lot of the conversation is focused. Um, and then six, there are, there are places where policy can address some of the market gaps and, and failures. Um, so for our workforce, we, we just need better talent and pipelines. Um, and then for education, AI is really not a priority, especially when competing against other areas of, of attention in the education sphere. Uh, and furthermore, like many schools are still work, trying to work uh, on implementing computer science education after many years of effort. So given the importance of, of uh, AI education and workforce and the AI workforce writ large, uh, what do we do about all this? Next slide, please. So we did a bunch of work uh, over the last couple of years, thanks mostly to, uh, to the leader of the workforce team, Diana Gelhaus, and my, and my colleagues, Dahlia Peterson and Kayla Good, as well as the data team. And all of that work led us to three driving policy goals. The one that we're addressing today is the second. Uh, so how do we sustain and diversify the existing pipelines of non-doctorate technical talent? Next slide, please. Uh, so one of the best ways to do this, we think, is to leverage community and technical colleges. So as an aside, if I say community colleges, the rest of the talk, I mean both community and technical colleges. I'm just using shorthand. So during the rest of the talk, I'll cover these seven things. So first, um, associate's degree and other credentials as an alternative to four-year degrees. Uh, what strengths community colleges have to, leather, let, uh, to leverage? Uh, what they're currently doing in AI education and training? Uh, what are the challenges that they've faced in providing this training? Um, some recent advancements uh, that they've made to address these challenges. And then from all of this, what goals should policymakers target? And what are some recommendations to help them reach those goals? So onto the first subject, the value of sub-baccalaureate credentials. So oftentimes in conversations about the AI workforce, you, you almost exclusively hear about technical team one. That's that PhD level or four-year master's degree students with, uh, of computer engineers, software developers, et cetera. In many cases, that's perfectly reasonable. Many jobs in the AI workforce do require a four-year degree or higher. Um, however, there are also many that do not. We did a lot of work uh, analyzing the workforce and about a third of the AI workforce actually doesn't have a four-year degree. Um, for context, about 60% of the total US workforce doesn't have one. That means that not all jobs require a four-year degree, even in artificial intelligence. In fact, even counting just those technical categories of workers, there are still about a quarter of those, uh, of those categories in the AI workforce uh, who do not have four-year degrees. So not only that, but as we talk about later, uh, ensuring alternative pathways to quality jobs other than four-year degrees as a pathway um, is part of a broader effort towards lifelong learning using something called stackable credentials. So this is so important because requiring a four-year degree for jobs that don't actually require a four-year degree just leaves a large group of hugely diverse talent behind, which is bad for the economy, it's bad for our national security, and it's bad for the workers who are left out. So community colleges are providers of these sub-baccalaureate credentials, but what other strengths do they have? Next slide, please. So the chart on the right is a breakdown of some of the uh, demographics of community colleges. Um, so in a nutshell, community and technical colleges serve traditionally underrepresented populations and they offer a stepping stone to both well-paying careers that don't require a four-year degree and those that do if they transfer into a four-year program. So we considered about 1,700 community and technical colleges in our research, uh, and they gave out about 900,000 associate degrees in 2020 and 700,000 sub-baccalaureate certificates. So as you can see uh, by the chart, they serve a very diverse population. So non-white students made up over 45% of the population of students and over 62% of the students were part-time. That's compared to only 19% at four-year colleges. They also have a way higher population of adult learners. They're also flexible and affordable. Uh, most public schools accept almost all applicants and are way less expensive than four-year colleges reducing student debt loads. They're also located all over the country in urban, suburban, and rural districts. So for students with a full-time job or who are the primary caretaker of their family or who can't attend an expensive school far from their home or anything else that many Americans have to deal with, community colleges offer a chance at education and training and upskilling 
and switching to new careers. Speaking of which, uh, they offer a range of career and technical education programs. Uh, these can be credit or non-credit training for specific employers, and many two-year institutions offer specific CTE pro pathways that teach field-specific competencies uh, that are a great path to middle school, middle school, middle skill jobs. And last but not least, it's that stackable credentials that I talked about. Um, they can embed them into many of their program options. So these are incremental awards that allow students to demonstrate competency in a certain skill or ability. Uh, they're designed to make students employable, and each credential can be stacked in the pursuit of further credentials. For example, a student might earn a skill certificate in machining, which may lead to a job, uh, and then they can return to school at their own pace and apply those credits that they earned to an associate's degree in like advanced manufacturing. This allows the student to jump in and out of education, upskilling at their own pace, while retaining those tangible credentials to show employers that they are skilled and able to be employed. Next slide, please. So um, with all of the great features of community and technical colleges I just highlighted and the demand for AI workers that will only continue to grow and the avail availability of AI jobs for associate degree holders, uh, what are community colleges doing right now to train AI talent? Um, Unfortunately, it turns out they're not doing so much. So we combed through uh, the National Center for Education Statistics. They have an integrated post-secondary education data system. So that's a mouthful, but it's the gold standard for enrollments and completion data in educational institutions. And we checked how many students are graduating in all programs that we deemed most likely to lead to AI education or AI occupations. So the main fields we highlighted are uh, computer and information science, some engineering technologies, and then select business fields. Uh, unfortunately, very few degrees and certificates were um, awarded in 2020. And then you could subcategorize by uh, specific um, subfields in those fields, and virtually none were given out in the AI specific fields. Uh, furthermore, the most promising computer and information science and engineering technologies had uh, stagnant growth over the last decade, uh, which we'll see on the next slide. Uh, also, women only earned about 23% of the CIS associate degrees and certifications and only about 15% of the engineering technology um, credentials, despite the fact that women made up uh, over 60% of community, uh, community and technical college attendees. So this fact echoes the broader gender diversity issues uh, that many STEM fields face. Uh, for business, less than 7% of awards in business were in the subspecialties we uh, found most related to AI product development and acquisition. Uh, so that's all the bad news. Uh, the final bullet is the one bright spot on the slide. So bear with me because I'm gonna stick with the bad news for the next couple of slides, but then we'll go back to some of the good news and we'll talk more about these partnerships that we see sprouting up. Next slide, please. So this is the, uh, these are uh, associate degrees awarded over the last 10 years. And you can see on the top that uh, liberal arts dominate associate's degrees by far, uh, follow, uh, followed by health professions. And then at the bottom there, uh, you can see the, uh, the four that are most AI specific trailing far behind. So what are the, what are the challenges that some of these community colleges are facing? Next slide, please. So I have to preface this by saying that each of these uh, bullets could be a dissertation in and of themselves. So I'll try to stay out of the weeds and give you a high level overview. So community colleges face general challenges across all fields, um, and then they face a few that are more specific to AI. So first I'll cover some of the general challenges. Uh, one of the biggest and main issues is that public two-year institutions are notoriously and chronically underfunded, and it's only gotten worse over time. Uh, and COVID just exacerbated that. Uh, many funding calculations at the state level are driven by enrollment numbers, and COVID hit community colleges worse than other um, institutions. It led to over a 10% decrease in enrollment. Um, this means less money uh, with more responsibilities like remote learning, contact tracing, and social distancing measures. Uh, measures. So they also have unique student needs. Um, they off, the, the needs of community college students often vary drastically from those at four-year colleges. Uh, they have needs like childcare, mental health counseling, food pantries and shelters, transit assistance, and more. These are called wraparound services. And uh, providing them is shown to drastically increase um, completions, uh, but they're often very underfunded. 
So that leads us to the other issue that there are many competing priorities at community colleges. They offer a million different programs. And while that's a huge strength of them, it's also a challenge because uh, they're very financially constrained and they have to choose where to put their limited funds, meaning other programs are underfunded. Uh, finally, the CTE programs I mentioned before can be very promising when implemented well, but when you have limited funding uh, and sometimes poor execution of these programs, it can lead to lackluster outcomes for students so they don't get jobs. So all of these factors lead to the overarching problem, which is persistently low completion rates for community colleges. Uh, the rate of attaining a credential within three years was just 33% for attendees. That fact is constantly pointed out by critics of community colleges, uh, but they often lack the context that is necessary to know why they're so low. So there are other features that are also challenging for AI specific programs. So one issue is getting good teachers for STEM fields, uh, an issue that my colleague Jack Corrigan is doing some great work on. Another is that students have college readiness problems. So prerequisite courses like calculus, for example, keep students away from, from these programs or drive them out if they attempt them. Uh, furthermore, echoing the, the previous problem, um, women also face larger barriers in AI education, mimicking the trend in other STEM fields where social and cultural factors push women out from an early age. Uh, community colleges are often very focused, both internally and through pressures from uh, external stakeholders like policymakers, on transferring students to four-year colleges. It's that classic go to community colleges for two years, get your liberal arts focused core classes out of the way and then save some money and then transfer to a four-year school to finish your four-year degree. Uh, despite this focus, uh, transfer uh, success rates for STEM are very low, and it drives focus away from programs that can lead to good jobs right out of, out of community colleges. So that was a lot, I know, and that was all challenges, but uh, believe me, there is some good news. Next slide, please. Um, so some innovative schools, some education researchers and interest organizations uh, have been working on ways to adjust these challenges and others, and there's been some very promising advancements. So I'll give a quick overview of some. So the first is guided pathways, which is meant to increase student completion by coupling predefined meta majors with intense advising and job coaching. So this directs students to a broad career field with multiple pathways to choose from. Um, and it helps students who might not be familiar with the college process and, and overwhelmed by the million classes and courses and programs that they're that they're presented with. Uh, pathways lead to, directly to credentials in many cases that can be stacked towards uh, further education or a job. Another is co-requisite education. So this is addressing that college readiness issue, um, like the calculus classes I mentioned. And it gives students extra support as they take those entry-level courses in, in particularly challenging subjects. And there's a million different models for this. Some of them are more effective than other, but there's a lot of great work on which ones um, seem to have shown progress and how to do them. So another is holistic advising, um, and th this, this tries to get out ahead of issues that may lead students to drop out, and it provides them upfront academic and career counseling and leverages something called early alerts to uh, intervene when students show early signs of struggles in their class, like they're missing classes, they did particularly poorly on a quiz or an exam, um, things of that nature. Uh, the final one is continuous improvement. So this is a little bit more rare uh, and it requires a, a fair amount of work, but it, it has shown signs of, of working very well. So it leverages data collection and analysis to assess the programs that are in place, student performance within those programs, and then efforts at mitigating um, uh, challenges that, that pop up. So this, this practice emphasizes frontline educator experience uh, very heavily. Um, in providing the solutions to problems and then test what is actually working. So not only are those general advancements promising, but there's also been over the last three or four years, a bunch of industry partnerships uh, with community colleges started by some of the biggest tech companies. Um, and some are larger or more robust, but many have promising features and it's showing that um, these big tech companies uh, are aware that they need to leverage community colleges and are, and are willing to put in some of the work needed to do so. So I'll run through a, little, a, a couple of the features. You can find information about all these programs online, but Intel is providing community colleges with over 200 hours of AI educational content spread across four different modules, as well as uh, over 60 hours of, of uh, teacher education so that they can teach classes. Uh, Amazon will give 
AWS ready to teach cloud computing curriculum for educators and training for faculty to become accredited, accredited AWS instructors. Uh, Google, through its Grow with Google initiative, is providing access to curriculum that they developed uh, in partnership with Coursera internally um, to all community colleges. And then Microsoft uh, is providing every community college across the country access to free curriculum, uh, educated training again, and then tools for teaching. So not only that, but many of these programs are, are embedding stackable credentials within them that in many cases can lead to uh, either a certification or, either, or even an associate's degree. And in the case of Intel, uh, they actively partnered with state and local organizations, as well as community college administrators and faculty to make sure that these materials were properly embedded into curriculum that, that worked well. Next slide, please. So given what they're currently offering, uh, given the challenges that they face and the advancements that are underway, uh, we looked at all that and we arrived at two policy goals for, for policymakers. The first is that states, institutions, and industry should work together to create AI-specific degree and non-degree credentials that are accepted by employers. So I haven't talked much about that last part yet, the employer acceptance of credentials, but that is a critical component and a very difficult one. Um, credentials are absolutely worthless if they do not lead to jobs and if the credential mark and if uh, and if employers are not willing to accept them as as a as a marker of, of competency. And frankly, the credential market right now is the wild, wild west with thousands of different credentials available and no one seems to be sure exactly which ones outside of a handful are worthy of getting. So that's that's a that's a huge thing to work on. And then the second goal is to get more diverse groups to start and finish AI programs. Uh, so institutions with employers should, should prioritize those programmatic advising and early outreach changes that uh, use the best practices that we just highlighted. So uh, given these goals, what can policymakers do about it? Next slide, please. So we came up with five recommendations to, to help leverage community colleges. Uh, the first recommendation is for the White House, and we recommend that the National AI Initiative Office, which is within the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, um, they should coordinate with the Office of the First Lady to establish a strategic line of effort. Uh, we brought up the Office of the First Lady in particular because uh, given her years of experience as a community college instructor herself and then also as an education advocate. So some things that they can do as part of this uh, line of effort is, um, besides just shine a spotlight on the issue and increase, increase uh, attention, is to hold a conference for those edu AI, education, AI educators to share best practices, to potentially give an award to stellar institutions in this field, and then to create a repository of program evaluations so that schools who are looking to create their own programs can see what works and what doesn't. So the next three recommendations are for Congress. Uh, they should establish a grant program for industry institution partnerships in AI. Uh, and they should also enact federal tax credits for companies that form partnerships with community colleges related to AI programs, like the ones that we're seeing crop up. These will help the funding gap that community colleges face, uh, allow for smart program design, and then further incentivize investment and partnership from private industry to build out this pipeline. And then Congress should fund the uh, a NIST uh, or another federal entity, if appropriate, to develop a framework of AI work roles and competencies that they maintain and keep updated regularly. They did a similar thing for NICE, uh, for cyber, which has proved to be hugely effective. And we don't think that they should do that because that was a significant investment, but something like that. Um, so this gets to the need for companies to accept the credential schools are giving out. Um, Work roles and competencies, uh, when created with stake with heavy stakeholder input, allows schools to know what employers want and allows them to design effective programs that the employers are then confident in. Uh, and then finally, uh, at the state level, states should facilitate articulation agreements uh, between two-year and four-year institutions that are at the public level for transfer and reverse transfer for AI programs. Uh, we recognize that this is a broader issue, not not uh, not solely related to AI, uh, but that's a good thing because it's a good thing to do. 
Um, so this allows community colleges to basically align some of their coursework uh, and the credits that that, that uh, courses uh, imbue with four year institutions so that those credits can be transferred back and forth. Um, this further ideas or improves the idea of those stackable credentials uh, and will help with those completion and transfer rates that I that I mentioned before. So that's uh, an overview of our work, uh, where the gaps are, where, where policymakers can step in. Um, and I'd be happy to answer questions that you may have. Um, or I can take my dog uh, for her walk because it's her first birthday today. So um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Luke. Um, once again, folks, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the raise hand function. You can also put them in the chat and I will ask them out loud on your behalf. Um, while, um, go ahead, Jessica. Oh, sorry, let me turn my camera on. Hey, Luke. Oh, looking at the wrong camera. Happy birthday to your dog. Um, also, so I just had a quick question. You mentioned briefly kind of like the pipeline issue um, with kind of like women in STEM and getting more diversity and how community colleges kind of like can be a solution for that because they're like overall more diverse than like the four-year college pipeline. But I was wondering um, like if in your work you ran into any potential solutions or like potential barriers in um, and like once people graduate from these institutions, get actually getting them jobs in like companies that are doing significant AI work. Cause there's also, I know there's like, in addition to the tier system we have with like US educational institutions, there's also like the company tier system and how like when you're splitting the AI work between private institutions and like not so much within the government, um, how what the people doing like working at the biggest AI institutions um, are often like also the, these institutions are often also the least institutions. So I was wondering if you guys ran into anything in that vein. Yeah, thank you, Jessica, for the question. Um, it's a really difficult problem. Honestly, we did run into a lot of that uh, in our work. Um, interesting in left, the community colleges, while they have very low completions and graduations rates for women in STEM fields, they do, uh, um, about 60% of the population is in is in uh, is female, which uh, mimics the four year institutions. But regarding getting big companies to change their hiring practices and their uh, professional development, it's very difficult to make companies do that on their own. Um, in the report, uh, which is actually coming out Thursday, um, we highlight one organization that has been very effective at this, um, and they're called Hack Diversity. They're they're Boston based. Um, and they basically take cohorts of traditionally underrepresented groups um, and they get them job placements in big tech companies and they work hand in hand with the companies and with the, with the cohort of fellows. And they basically outline what the company should be doing um, to increase their diversity, both in gender and in race and ethnicity. And then they hold them to that. Um, so they have it written down, like, this is what you should be doing. This is how you can increase. This is how you can better your workplace culture. Um, and uh, they've shown really, really, really good success. So uh, we have a, a section in our report highlighting that. So if you're interested in exactly what they're doing to make that happen, um, I suggest that you check that out. But honestly, it's a really hard uh, question. That's why that go-between organization is um, incredibly, incredibly valuable. Cool. Thank you. And a uh, just quick follow-up question, assuming no one else has any questions for now. Um, do you think kind of like pushing the AI angle is an effective way to increase funding for community colleges? Because um, it seems like we've just come up against this like over and over again. It's been decades and we saw like during, like you mentioned during the pandemic, how like a lot of these institutions can like barely stay afloat um, and like are literally cutting it close year to year. Um, so do you think like the AI, like the, the urge for the US to be like an like a le international leader in AI will be enough to galvanize like funding in education? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it is, uh, it is a way to do it, but not the way to do it. So uh, this is a way to galvanize more funding for these specific programs, and I hope to get more funding generally. Uh, but 
the funding streams for community colleges are extremely complex. There's there's different funding mechanisms and grant programs that come from the federal and state level. You can't use funding from some of them for all programs. Um, and it's incredibly complex. And honestly, the rec one recommendation is just fund community colleges more across all of those. But specific to AI, this is a way to galvanize support for this specific area. And then if it can show success, then maybe it's a it incentivizes further investment in other programs. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Any other final questions before we let everyone enjoy what I hope is decent weather out right now? It looks a little cloudy, but I think I think the rain is staying away. So yeah, it's good weather. All right, well, thank you, Luke, so much for joining us today. Um, and thank you to those of you who joined in the audience. Um, Luke, where can people find out more about the work that you're doing on this um, and any upcoming work on the topic? Yeah, sure. So you can follow us on Twitter. If you just search CSET, then it should come up. We're very active there. And when our reports are posted, it comes out there. You can also find us online. Let me check the website really fast because my brain is not letting me remember. It's cset.georgetown.edu. You can find all our publications there as well. Um, and like I said, this report is coming out Thursday and we've got a lot more in the pipeline. So plus there's a lot of other national security focused artificial intelligence work um, that is just absolutely stellar for my colleagues. So that's where you can find it. Great. Uh, folks, be sure to check out those resources and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Jordan. Thanks everyone for joining.